Welcome to Caffeinated Flicks. I'm Celeste. And I'm Kenzie. We're two chicks who drink coffee and celebrate flicks from diverse directors. If you like what you're hearing so far, take a moment to follow us in your favorite podcasting app. And give us a rating or review. Here's the show. And two, three, go! <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> Thankful for this MLK day, MLK weekend. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about that all weekend. I'm like, I'm so glad I don't have to work on Monday. I just wanted to be able to just like sit, relax, just chill. Right. That was me yesterday. I was out with my mom and I was like, thank goodness we don't work tomorrow. Because at this moment, we would be like getting like the Sunday sadness. What do they call it? The Sunday something. Right. The Sunday scaries. <laughs> for monday <laughs> like oh yes <laughs> yeah yeah oh, so did you have any good coffee or caffeine today no i didn't i woke up late and then <laughs> i spent so the rest of the morning just finishing the notes that i waited to do last minute <laughs> <laughs> hey that is fair that is totally fair i woke up early this morning on accident what? that doesn't surprise me for you because you know. you're always so up you're up so early all the time yeah i don't know my brain kind of flips back and forth but yeah so i woke up at like 6 30 and i was like okay mm -hmm. i tried watching it last night but i couldn't follow it so let's see if we can watch it again today and so then i watched it and then i watched the 1994 version Oh, did you? I way. thought about doing that, but yeah, I was like, I want to see how this compares. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like two or three other versions, aren't there? Probably, it yeah. wouldn't surprise me. Pretty sure there is. Yeah, there's quite it's a, a very popular story. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, so I am, I made myself a Chemex, a what? Hot coffee today um oh it's like a, a pour over it's a fancy pour over uh, so <laughs> yeah so i i like it it just takes a lot of time you have to be very patient for a chemex because like you've got your filter and you have to heat up your water and then you have to pour the water over the coffee but you can't pour it all at once like it, it's it's a long process but it's well worth it in my opinion i really like the coffee that comes out of it it's just something i don't do all that often so i only do on like days when I don't have a whole lot to do and I can, yeah. you know, chill and relax and focus on that and not forget it. <laughs> How does it differ though? Is it stronger? Are the flavors different? Does it enhance the Yeah, flavors? it just kind of brings out different qualities of the coffee. So that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's so many facets to brewing coffee and how it changes the flavor between like a French press, which has a coarser ground, a Chemex, a regular coffee pot, espresso, like so many things. And mm -hmm. I have yet to taste like Cuban or Turkish coffee, but that is on my list at some point. There you go. <laughs> so shall we get into our movie? Yes, let's please do it. Which All we right. should probably mention that we're doing Little Women. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The 2019 <laughs> version. <laughs> so today's movie is Little Women. The 2019 version, as we mentioned, there's like, 50 million uh, versions of this movie. So yeah, so Greta Gerwig is the director. I just had to mention that her middle name is Celeste. Just oh, like how cute. I know. <laughs> so Greta is also an actress, a playwright, and a screenwriter. She was born August 4th of 1983. So she is a Leo. And she was born in Sacramento, California. She never officially attended film school. Instead, she learned everything she could about filmmaking from onset observations as an actress and a writer. Very cool. She did intend to get a degree in musical theater in New York, but she graduated from Bernard College in New York, where she studied English and philosophy instead. Her directorial debut was a movie called Nights and Weekends from 2018, which she also starred in and wrote the script. Then, almost 10 years later, was her next directing project, 
So that would have been followed by the five times Oscar nominated Lady Bird from 2017. And then, of course, last year's blockbuster she also directed, which was Barb's. And then an upcoming project that she's doing, which was confirmed, includes a new Chronicles of Narnia movie for Netflix. So I'm so confused. How can they have so many movies? <laughs> I don't know. I so, so, like, I saw that they were going to make them, like, a series or movies or a series of movies. I don't know. But apparently she's confirmed to do two of them so far. So Oh, my. I don't know. You. okay i don't know we'll, we'll see we'll see how those turn out <laughs> as mentioned she is also an actress so some of her acting credits include 20th century woman jackie no strings attached and the mindy project including so, so a many few more. natalie portman things <laughs> yes mm -hmm. a few natalie portman things <laughs> and then fun fact she grew up in a household without television I always wonder if that helps to fuel creativity or dampen it. I feel like I could go either way. Yeah. Either way. Mm -hmm. Probably just and based then, on the person. Yeah. <laughs> and then she was raised. So she, apparently she went to Catholic, girls Catholic school, but she was raised oh. as a Unitarian Universalist. So I have to do more research on what that means. I have no idea. <laughs> I Googled it and I was still confused. <laughs> <laughs> what? What's like, I feel like it's just a lot of religion, honestly. Pretty much. It's just a mesh of everything. It's just like a big wow. like, random guidelines that you follow. I don't know. Okay. I don't <laughs> She's just universally Christian. Is, there you is go, what yeah. I <laughs> oh my. Oh man. So getting into the cast, this is like a mega all-star cast we've got here. It truly. Oh man, I forgot to look up how she pronounces her name. Shorsha, I believe it is. Shorsha Ronan as Joe. We've got Florence Pugh's Amy, Timothy Chalamet as Lori, Emma Watson, Meg, and Eliza Scanlon as Beth. And then of course we've got Meryl Streep, Laura Dern in it, James Norton, Bob Odenkirk. Oh, Dunkirk. Oh, we yeah. got Chris Cooper in it. Tracy Letts. Just I love seeing Laura Dern in this. I just love her so much. Like really? I, I pretty much the entire cast of Jurassic Park. If I see them in anything, I'm just like, oh my god, it's you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't watch Big Little Lies, but I know she was in one of Taylor Swift's music videos. <laughs> Well, she was at the opening night of the Eras tour. I remember. Oh my gosh! <laughs> That's That's amazing. <laughs> What's um, funny about the fact that this is also like a star-studded cast is like when you go back to the 1994 version, that was also a star-studded cast because they had Susan Sarandon, Winona Ryder, Kristen, Chris, oh Kristen, yeah, Christian Christian Bale. Bale, and then Kristen yeah. Dunst. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got Claire Danes and like all of these other really prolific actors in that movie. And then when we have this one 25 yeah. years later, we've got the the star-studded cast of, you know, this new of 2019 generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Some, some interesting facts about casting here. Uh, so when Shorsha Ronan first heard about the project, she was the one that reached out to Greta Gerwig and told her, she decided she was going to play Joe. <laughs> and of course, and she brought her away. So <laughs> she's got some cojones and I like it. <laughs> yeah, she does. <laughs> um, so apparently Emma Watson was the one that took over the role of Meg March from Emma Stone, who oh. became unavailable due to scheduling conflicts with promoting the movie that she did, The Favorite, in 2018. Now, I cannot picture emma, emma watson stone in this role i feel like emma watson just has like this like like innocence and like femininity about her and emma stone i feel like she's like a more edgy character right i'm sorry yeah, I, I mean i can't be emma stone in this I, and i yeah. also feel like she's this is gonna sound weird but i can't see her in a period piece like she just looks too modern and urban and like, oh, really? Emma... did you watch the movie The Favorite? Because that one's a period piece, also. Oh, no, I did not. Apparently, mm -hmm. I need to. 
Yeah, oh, I, yeah. See, she looks weird to me in this. Does she? <laughs> <laughs> is it the is like, it the eye just, from the fact? Is that what they call it? Where you look at an actor and if they look like they know what an iPhone is, then they don't belong. <laughs> or they oh don't my gosh, fit I like know, the I, image. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. I'll have to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yep, I'll yep. have to I'll have to watch it sometime. I know it looks I just didn't get to it. But yeah. It's on the list, of course. We'll watch to be fine. <laughs> well, yeah, it's impossible to get to all of them. And then last, so Shore Sharonin, Timothy Chalamet, and Tracy Letts were actually all together in Greta's previous movie, Lady Bird, together. So she's just recycling actors. When you work with somebody and you work with somebody well, it, it's, okay. it's nice to have them back. They had a good thing going. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially because there was always like so many people in each scene, like in right. one of the sure. scenes, so you got a lot going on, a lot to work with. <laughs> it's probably just like I want something that's comfortable and I know that works. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh, I'm curious as to how how Greta had directed this because I feel like a lot of how the movie came together had to have happened in like editing. I feel like they might have done like in chronological order and then cut it up in editing to make it more interesting. Oh yeah. I wonder that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I did read apparently because they had to do like camera tricks as far as like angles and recording like that when it came to the scenes with Timothy Chalamet. Because they're like, oh, he's only 5'10". So we had to do Oh my gosh. I'm like, (laughs) that's tall. Like that's not... (laughs) Well, and especially for a period piece, like men were not terribly tall in the 1800s or whatever, huh. you know, in the early 1900s. Like they weren't that tall. And I know. <laughs> you know, it just makes sense that it, he's 5'10", and there's nothing wrong with that. Like the average height for a What's man, I believe, average? is like 5'10", 5'11". And so he's yeah. average height. Like, I mean, it's something that they're like, oh, he's only 5'10". I'm like, mm. let's just. <laughs> oh, how silly. I know. How silly. It's like trying to film anything with Tom Cruise. I like everybody likes to make fun of him because he's short. And he has to wear like oh, lips yeah. and you have to like do the different angles and stuff too for him. Yeah. I remember as an interview for it was one of the Thor movies, and you know how Natalie Portman is in it. They said that she had to stand on a box sometimes just for some of the kissing scenes. I'm like, just own uh, it. Own the fact right? you're short. <laughs> and obviously, that especially for that, because he's supposed to be a god. Like he's supposed to be right. Like, massive and tall like it wouldn't make He's sense for her to, to be like, like her up you know i, know, that, I think that would have been so much better <laughs> <laughs> like short mortal human let me go ahead and yes. lift you <laughs> that would have been amazing oh god shall we go ahead and get into the ratings <laughs> absolutely so the 10 out of 10 incredible adaptation Greta Gerwig managed to take a book that has been adapted multiple times and given us something that comes across as completely original. The performances of the four main actresses come across as authentic sisterhood, while Watson and Ronan are exceptional, as well as the best known of the young actresses. It's Pew and Scanlon, 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 that steal the show. The cinematography, coupled with De Platt's score, is breathtaking and should easily pick up multiple award nominations. While I am certain that it will go head-to-head with movies like The Irishman, this is the one that will stand the test of time. In my humble opinion, this movie is perfect, and I can't wait to see it again. All right, so one out of ten, a total waste of time. (laughs) This movie is a complete mess, to say the least. Disappointment is the best word that can be said about it. Characters are flat, and most important, there is absolutely no There is absolutely no any story or (laughs) spotlight. The director is helpless. A movie that couldn't be saved even by Meryl Streep and Chris Cooper. This movie will convince you to never read the book if you haven't already, which is unfortunate. It's an insult to the Oscars this movie was even nominated. The Parasite film was only slightly better. What? Why do we... (laughs) 
<laughs> the I, blunt feminism statements don't make this movie any better. Thank you for losing two hours of my life. P.S. Nice costumes and well deserved Oscar for that. Why are you going to make a dab at Parasite for this? <laughs> I don't know. And I'm very confused. Like the blunt feminism statements, like mm-hmm. the it's based off the book and the book itself is, you know, feminist. Yeah. So and clearly <laughs> they've alluded to the idea that they've read the book. So I'm very confused as to why. They clearly missed the point of the book. Yeah. They put- it, it was just too much. It was too far into the subtext. You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, dare they. Oh, boy. Well, shall we get into the recap then? Let's do it. So as we mentioned, this movie is back and forth all the time, which you can clearly tell just based on like the coloring or the lighting. So like Mm -hmm. the future, it's very dark and blue. And then the past, the flashbacks are bright, bright, colorful. colorful. So it's a lot of back and forth. So apologies in advance. (laughs) All right, so we open with uh, text on screen, a quote from uh, Louisa May Alcott. Uh, I've had lots of troubles, so I write jolly tales. Uh, so we've got Joe, who she's selling one of her stories to a publisher. Uh, so she is in New York. Uh, the publisher advised for, so he's reading her stuff and he's just crossing things off. She's like, <laughs> Like whole pages. Like you can't possibly be reading them all down when he's just smacking them down. So he advises her for future stories that if a woman is the main character to make sure that by the end uh, she's married or dead, either or. <laughs> he's like, I don't care which, just make sure it's either yeah. married or dead. So, <laughs> yeah. So she's like, okay. So she's got to make a buck apparently. Um, but he ends up taking, he ends up taking it and making his edits. So she, she I forgot how much she makes, but she makes a buck. So he she asks how much she'd be compensated for it. And he says, for this sort of thing, we pay 25 to 30. So I will give you 20 mm-hmm. for it. And I was like, yeah. I don't understand that logic. Oh, yeah. Ooh. And she goes in saying that it's her friend's work. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, OK, well, tell your friend. <laughs> when at first, I thought that she was implying that it was a guy. So that way, maybe she might get more mm-hmm. respect or maybe get compensated more. But she gives a female right. name. She doesn't like, give a name at all. She, she he asks her what name to put on it. And she says, I, don't put a name on there. Yeah. But I thought like she implies that it's a she. Yes. Yeah. She she refers well, to her friend her. It with she, her pronouns. Yeah, exactly. So... It didn't make sense to me that, like, I felt like she should have been like, he, him. So that way, maybe. I thought that was going to be the same way, too, but it did not. No, it didn't work out that way. Maybe it was just because she was embarrassed, maybe. I don't know. But so then we move over to Amy, who is painting in Paris. And she is with her Aunt March, who tells her that she cannot go back until she's engaged. Because she is the hope for her family. And they're riding on a carriage and passing by, we see Lori in slow motion. He's like supposed to be like this dream <laughs> character, dream boy character, I guess. Hello. <laughs> um, so she sees him and she like jumps out of the carriage basically. And they're like ecstatic to see each other. And uh, she apologizes to him for the fact that Joe turned him down. You know, she is very sorry to hear about that. It- and then she invites him to their New Year's Eve party that's happening. Yes. Come dressed in silk or I don't know what. Whatever rich people were at the time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So then we see Meg, who is fabric fabric shopping, and she's being pressured into buying this beautiful green fabric that she clearly cannot afford, but she ends up going for it anyways. (laughs) And then we see Beth, who is playing the piano beautifully. So it turns out the actress, Eliza, who plays Beth, she ended up practicing three hours a day which was a requirement in order to know how to play the piano in order to play the role of Beth. So, you know, I was thinking about that. I'm like, as Beth, you really don't have a whole lot that you're doing in this movie other Mm -hmm. than playing the piano. And it's like, you're either dying or you're playing the piano. (laughs) And so (laughs) your whole character, no, she's so shy and reserved. So it's like, Mm -hmm. so yeah, (laughs) I'm sure she was like, you have to know how to play. (laughs) (laughs) Like the only action you take you have to play the piano it's the only thing you do as the actor on this <laughs> yes 
Oh man. So Joe goes to like this like this par- bar looking place underground. She goes dancing and she has her eye on a fellow teacher or um, oh gosh, what is he? A professor at the school mm-hmm. that she teaches, Mr. Frederick. And so we just get a glimpse of them dancing together. Then we get seven years earlier text on screen. <laughs> so all the girls are in a room together and Joe are met and Meg are getting ready for a party. Joe bumps in at this party. So Meg is more of like the extrovert in the situation. She's more of an introvert in the sense that she just does not want to be there. Meg is more social. She wants to meet people. She wants to mingle. She wants to dance. And Joe is just not into that. So she goes well, into a room. I also think that Meg is the oldest, and so she's trying to find a suitor, and she's trying to yeah. get married. And so, like, the point of going to these parties is that to there are someone. eligible bachelors there who she can mm-hmm. meet, and then become courted, become engaged to, and then marry um, okay. because she wants to be married at some point in time. Joe, however, has absolutely no interest in it whatsoever. So I think a lot of it has to do with that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a contrasting difference, like a major contrast between the two of them. Like she genuinely wants to get married. She wants to fall in love Mm -hmm. and start a family. And Joe does not want that. So she hides away in a room where she bumps into Lori. Um, He's also hiding away. I'm not really sure (laughs) what his dealio is at that time. But they decide to go dancing together alone on like the patio. So they're just... They look like major goofballs together. They immediately hit it off. I like the connection right away for someone who like right. some people who just met to already be like that together. <laughs> it was instant for them. Call each other's lead <laughs> so instinctly. <laughs> oh man. So dancing, Meg ends up spraining her ankle. Mm-hmm. And she's Lori wearing shoes that are not the right size. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's wearing shoes that are too small. And so she ends up spraining her ankle because of it. <laughs> oh, man. So he, Lori ends up taking them home and it's just chaos at their house. So all their sisters are helping. Like, there's just so much going on. There's just so much love and happiness in the room. And you can there see is. Lori, like, and this really is where we get it. to see Marmy for the first time, too. Marmy. And I love yeah. her so much when she comes in. <laughs> and she's just so joyous. She's like, oh, my poor dear. What did you do? And then she's explaining. She's apologizing for the chaos and saying, I just, I do some midnight baking. Do here, have a scone. And then she's taking care of her daughters. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> Lori, come in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just a lot going on. <laughs> All right, and then we flash forward to Joe in New York. So we're at the future or present times writing, and she's writing in, what is it? Like, is so she lives where she works, essentially, because she's a teacher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a boarding that's... school, and so she's like a governess or something of that nature, from what I mm-hmm. understand. I get. I guess she lives in-house where she works. But um, so she's writing in her room, and uh, she hears a knock on the door and opens it to see that she's received some Shakespeare books from Frederick. And then Amy is at, she's at that ball that she previously mentioned. And Laurie comes in with a couple of girls on his arm and he is drunk. He is plastered. Um. <laughs> so the fun thing about this is like, so at, at this ball, she's supposed to be being courted by fred vaughn Mm -hmm. and so she's dancing with fred and she excuses herself to go talk to Lori because Lori was supposed to pick her up at a hotel like much earlier in the evening and she She waited like an hour yeah yeah (laughs) exactly and so there's like this little bit of a feud between her attention for Lori and fred because for her family her aunt March says you need to marry Fred because he's very, very wealthy and he'll take care of you mm-hmm. and the rest of your family. And no, she's in love with Lori and she has been ever since she met him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so rude because he's acting like really obnoxious and loud. And he's like, Fred Vaughn, everyone. And he basically like potentially 
tarnishes her chance of actually marrying this guy, which is... Right. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So we're back at Joe, and she, sta- she shares her stories with Frederick, and he gives his honest opinion, and he tells her that he does not like her work. And I... she is seriously offended by this. <laughs> she is. Like, she's the most offended that she's ever been in. And yeah. what I don't understand is... Like, it's fine if you don't like it, but you need to say why. Like, we never yeah. understand why he doesn't like it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it's because she's right. She's writing what she thinks other people want to read. I think she's basically, I, I took it as she took the publisher's notes and wrote what will sell. And I, I thought okay. that's what she was sharing with him. Okay. Because See, I think he like, mentioned like to, that he, it's not like personal or yeah it's not like her actual stories interesting reading more clearly defined in the 1994 version of the movie and oh, in here it? Me, it's not clear at all i, I just heard i don't like <laughs> and yeah, i'm like, like well, okay, but why <laughs> yeah but also to be fair she doesn't give a chance to like she doesn't ask she's like oh what don't you like yeah, about she's just she doesn't like, ask she shuts them down she interrupts <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. So at that time, she receives a letter from her mom telling her to come home immediately because Beth has taken a turn for the worse. So we flash back to Christmas when the girls were younger. So their mom, Marnie, ends up coming back. She was with the family previously because they're not doing well. There's a single mother who is a young mother and she has children that are ill. So she comes back and she asks her daughters if they would be willing to gift their Christmas breakfast as a gift to them because they could seriously use it. (laughs) So they head off with all their goodies and they go to help out this poor family. And so Lori's and is it his uncle? Mr. Mm -hmm. Lawrence. Oh, wait, I just know it's his grandfather. It's his grandfather. Grandfather. Okay, good. So they live like kind of like across the way so they can kind of like see them at all times if they leave the house which is kind of creepy. So, they, <laughs> so he sees the girls leaving with their christmas breakfast so when they return they come back to this like lavish freaking breakfast there it's like a full breakfast <laughs> it's beautiful delicious foods so they gifted that to them and also their father is away at war so marmy received a letter and she decides to read it to them he has joined the union army and he volunteered Mm -hmm. and earlier when joe bumped into Lori for the first time ever at the party she had said boy i wish i was a boy i could have gone with him to war but at last i'm not a boy (laughs) in so many words yeah (laughs) so joe goes to visit her aunt march who apparently employs her to read at one point, Aunt March is like, I don't employ you to do this or a lot. Of, but she, right. it's never mentioned, like, specifically what she does for her. I'm assuming to read to her. So they called her her companion a couple of times. And then later on, mm-hmm. Amy's her companion. And at first, I thought that was just, like, a volunteer family thing. And then I realized, oh, no, she's actually getting paid for it or she's actually providing a service. So I think she just, like tends to her and like entertains her in some way yeah i guess so yeah that is my guess <laughs> i i've i am not from this era so <laughs> this right, i can only okay. entertain <laughs> i guess if you're that rich you can afford to pay for anything just literal companionship so right <laughs> makes sense what i don't her. understand yeah. is so the girl's dad in this version of the movie is her brother and i don't know why she's rich and he's not she does mention that she kept her money better than her father did but i don't know what happened and i'm so confused by that but then in the 1994 version he their their father is her nephew so that makes sense as to why he wouldn't have as much money as she does because it's not like a a same same link huh. oh okay yeah i don't know i don't know questions to the universe there we go, there we go. <laughs> so at this point aunt march also asks her 
if she would like to accompany her on her next trip to Europe. And of course, she's ecstatic. She's like, yes, I would love to. That's like a dream, oh, man. I know. <laughs> it reminds me of Gilmore Girls when Rory goes to Europe with her grandmother for the summer. I'm like, can I please? Yes, please. please. <laughs> oh, man. So Amy's at school. And I guess like the girls like pressure her to like draw a picture of the teacher. And she's like, no, I can't. And then she decides to do it. She gets caught. And back in those days, they get a serious whooping because she's outside of Lori. I don't understand why she's outside of Lori's house, though. But she is. So I think what it is is she's supposed to be, like, trying to figure out how to go home and, like, mm -hmm. mention that she's been disciplined and she, she did something bad. And so she can't figure out because she mentions, like, I can't go home. Oh, God. Yeah. And, like, you're being a little dramatic, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because they live literally right across the way like she's just standing yeah. in the middle between their houses and she's just like oh, yes. what do i do what do i do <laughs> oh god yeah so at that time Lori is like he has like his own tutor at home and he's looking out the window and he's like there's a girl out there and the tutor's like stop messing around like let's get back to work and he's like no really there's a girl out there and then he comes over he's like oh there is a girl out there and it's just her crying <laughs> I know it's so funny. <laughs> oh, man, but she's she plays the perfect biggest baby. <laughs> I know she's like. I love all of the actresses in this movie mm -hmm. who play all these different sisters because you can really get a sense of like how their personalities interact with one another and how they're mm -hmm. also different and how they like you can just sense and feel the the true character of these these characters. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So he invites her in, of course. And next thing we know, all of the sisters come over. Marmy comes over. She's like, thank you so much for taking care of my girls. They tend to get into this, <laughs> but they really like lighten up the home. Like they brighten mm -hmm. it up because you get a sense when it's just them, the, the grandfather and the Lori. It's very like dark. It's, it's reserved. They're not, they're not a loving family. That's for sure. <laughs> You don't have that same relationship. They're just not as that lively. That's all. <laughs> what? I said they're just not as lively. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I know, because the moment they walk out the door, it's just like dead silence. It's crickets. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, get back to work. <laughs> it's like, it's time to get back to your studies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and at that time, Mr. Lawrence, he also invites Beth to play the piano as well. Mm -hmm. So we see the girls have like their own theater club. Joe likes to write plays. Meg is an actress. They put on like these cutesy plays where they play men in the theaters. So cute. <laughs> it is adorable. They all have like smoking pipes. And yeah. they put on trousers <laughs> and like draw mustaches on their faces. And they're just like, hmm, her, hmm, her, her, her. Her. <laughs> I mean, um, so Joe suggests to invite Lori to be a member of their club, and they're all against it. They're like, no, this is an all-girls club. We can't have him. And he said, well, she's like, please reconsider. Like, <laughs> and they're like, fine. And it turns out he was, like, in the closet the whole time, and he jumps out. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm like, what if they had said no? What if they'd stuck to their guns know. and were like, no, we don't want him here? <laughs> Poor guy would just have to like awkwardly come out and be like, okay, sorry. Technically, they did say no, but he jumped out and they were like, fine. Yeah. <laughs> so we flash forward uh, to present day to, to draw, uh, to Joe, <laughs> to Joe. I'm like, to draw. Uh, flash <laughs> forward to present day to Joe arriving back home uh, to see Beth. And then we flash back right away. <laughs> the night that Meg and Joe get invited to a play and Amy really wants to go but she was not invited so Amy is pissed about this which I just don't understand why she has to take it out on Joe because even Meg know. is like I'm sorry like you weren't invited <laughs> right but like, sweet as she yeah, is she's like you can't, you can't like, come yeah much younger it's yeah not fair but like deal with it man mm-hmm 
So as retaliation, Amy, she decides to burn Joe's story, which is just the worst thing possible. So Joe comes back <laughs> and she brawls, man. She full on attacks. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Cat but, fight. This is where the cat fight was invented. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which it didn't even look like a, comp- a fair competition because Joe was just on her. It wasn't even like back and forth. <laughs> no. She no, was just it was the pounce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the apology, there was like a pathetic version of an apology or excuse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's like, I'm sorry. And her mom's like, come on. And Amy's like, I'm sorry. It's just that you all, all you care about is your stories. And I can't hurt you by ruining one of your dresses because you don't care about your appearances. And I really wanted to hurt you. And like her sister's expressions were just like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you call that an apology. <laughs> Oh, it was so funny because she's just like, oh, but I really wanted to hurt you. Well, at least you were being honest about it. So, <laughs> But like just Meg and Beth's facial expressions are like serious. Yeah, just- I think the most like animosity comes between Joe and Amy. And mm-hmm. I think it has to do with, from what I can tell, because they're both middle children. And so they're both like mm-hmm. vying for whatever uh, as a middle uh, child or maybe that's just how amy sees it because she mentions that she's always second to joe yeah so i think she's the third sister mm-hmm. she does yeah I but think beth she's is third. the baby right that's what it looks like in this movie so to her she's like joe is always the person that people look up to and i'm also an artist i'm also a creative but i'm always mm-hmm. second best yeah Okay, I'm just going to look it up really quick because I saw it and I meant to take note of it. <laughs> take note of what? Of like the girls' orders. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, because like I was really confused when I was watching the 1994 version because it looked like Kirsten Dunst's character of Amy was the youngest. Mm-hmm. And I was so confused. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's supposed to be Meg's the oldest. Joe is next. Oh, Bess is the middle child. And Amy is the baby. Hmm. Oh. So. That doesn't come across in this version. (laughs) You're like, yeah, that's not how it is in my mind. (laughs) In my head, Amy is third. Beth is fourth. (laughs) Oh, man. All right. So uh, the next day. Joe is clearly, they're at breakfast. There's a lot of tension. Uh, This is when Amy comes down for breakfast. Joe wants nothing to do with her. She literally gets up and moves to the other side of the table. So Lori comes over to take Joe ice skating. So she leaves right away. And Amy's like, wait, you said I could go. So she decides to end up following along from behind. Well, her sister say, you should go. Don't say anything. Just go. Let her know that you're sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. bad decision or bad idea <laughs> because when they're skating Lori tells joe to stick to the edges because it's dangerous to skate towards the middle of course because they're ahead amy doesn't hear that so she's skating in the middle and she falls through a thin piece of ice so i had not watched the movies i had not seen the previous movies and i knew that one of the sisters died in the movie mm-hmm. and i thought it was going to be her I know it just makes sense I was like (laughs) makes sense and also it wouldn't be as sad because she deserved it (laughs) she She is a brat I will give you that (laughs) she's a brat but it wouldn't have it wouldn't have affected the family as much probably because part of like Beth's character dying is that she's like so good and it's not fair that the good always die young kind of a thing you know Mm -hmm. yep yep (laughs) And it gives Amy a chance to try and redeem herself in some way. Yeah. And then, so they put Amy to bed. She's fine. They don't even think she's going to get a cold. But Joe feels terrible, of course. She says she feels terrible because when she gets in a passion, she can hurt anyone and she'd enjoy it. Marnie tells her that she reminds her a lot of herself because she's nearly angry every day of her life. But she's like, you're never angry. And she's like, I just have 40 years of practice of hiding it, basically. 
She's basically Bruce Banner. She's just yes. keeping the Hulk inside at all times. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As we flash forward to present day to Beth waking up to Joe being home. And of course, she makes sure that Amy doesn't know because she doesn't want her to cut her trip short from Paris. A wild thing to to keep from. It is wild. Yeah. So when (laughs) Joe arrives earlier to when she comes back home, she asks if Amy knows or if she's on her way home. And they're like, we don't want to worry her. And so she gets irritated. She's like, of course. She never has to deal with anything heavy (laughs) or serious. I know. She's still a brat. (laughs) Which at that time, she's 20 years old. By the way, she's not a baby. (laughs) She's not a big job. She's 20. (laughs) Wow. That's good to know. Yeah. Because it mentioned it later on, but she's 20 years old at that time. I missed that. I, it's so easy to miss a lot <laughs> it's, it's so, well, so, it's so easy like so it takes so, you realize that you're doing flashbacks and what the timeline's <laughs> like and all that. so flashback again to meg she got invited to a debutante ball and it's so funny because you can just overhear the girls talking i think it's uh, joe that's like follow her and make sure she doesn't fall in love first <laughs> and at that time mr lawrence so Mr. Lawrence ended up lending her a carriage so that way she can take that to the debutante ball. And he also asks Beth if she could play his piano to tune it up for him. Because, and he promises that she will not be disturbed or that she will not be disturbing him and that he will not be listening. Oh, so of course so she's sweet. very excited. So she's like, yes, I would be happy to. <laughs> she's so like shy, like she is so shy. Because at that time, she, like, steps in front of her mom. She's like, I can do that. And then she steps back. Like, right <laughs> after her. <laughs> like, she's not someone who likes being in the spotlight, the center of attention. So Meg arrives at the location for the debutante ball. And they're going up some stairs. And all the other girls are mentioning how they have multiple dresses for different parts of the night. And they're like, what are you wearing? And she's like, I'm wearing this. And (laughs) so clearly, like, it's very prominent that she doesn't have money as opposed to the other girls who are much more fortunate than her. And then one of the girls just decides to call her Daisy. And that's the the name that they call her. Like, she doesn't correct them or or she just is like, okay, she accepts it. She's like, I'm adopting you for the evening. You're going to be my little pet and I'm going to call you Daisy. (laughs) And she ends up giving her, like, an extra dress that she has, like a pink frilly dress, to wear for the evening. So Lori ends up surprising her by showing up to this event. And he's like, why are they calling you Daisy? (laughs) She's like, oh, it's just a little pet name. So he basically expresses his disappointment in her and the unapproval of the event he's like i don't like it here i don't like ruffles and because uh, she's like well do you like the way i look and he's like no i don't i don't like <laughs> so i don't like frills like he's so rude about it and so yes. of course she runs off she's and like, she calls him out on it though yeah she does i don't know what exactly she says she's like you're the meanest guy or something along those lines <laughs> But then he apologizes and then asks her to dance anyway. And so all is forgiven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but before that, we get a different scene. <laughs> so Beth goes over <laughs> to play Mr. Lawrence's piano. He ends up listening in and he's just in awe of her talent. And he starts to get emotional. So I didn't mention it before, um, but it was mentioned that he had a daughter who had passed away. And she was a young girl. I don't think they said her age, but she was a young girl. (laughs) So then we cut back to the debutante ball. And yes, Lori apologizes to Meg for being a douchebag. And she asks him to not tell Joe because she realizes how, like, embarrassing or I don't know what is the word. My cheek just twitched. (laughs) It distracted me. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) I (laughs) need it. (laughs) <laughs> is that? Oh, you were thinking about how your cheek was twitching. I was like, wait, what? 
<laughs> that's, that's my eye does that sometimes. Most of the time when I've got a migraine, like my eye will twitch huh? uncontrollably. And I'm like, oh my God, would yeah. you just stop? Please. Stop. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh gosh. So yeah. So she asks him to not tell Joe because she realizes like how silly it is and to just let her have her fun for tonight and that she will be desperately good for the rest of her life if she can just have that. And then we flash I mean, forward. Girls just want to have fun, man. We all exactly. need a, a night she needs to or let two loose. To just pretty and just, you she's know, beautiful. Be different. Especially because she's the oldest. So, you know, she's right. probably always taking care of everyone's right. needs before her own. So she just wants this one night to herself. And then, like, of course, when she gets married, this will never happen again. So just let her have it. Well, I know. Poor, poor Meg. So we flash forward to Meg. And her husband, who are seriously poor, they're going over their finances and how she bought $50 worth of fabric. So she was actually supposed to use that money to get his jacket fixed because apparently it's in distress. And Tell that it's like a tense scene, but he's not angry and she's yeah. upset. Like she she, she feels herself like enormously guilty yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, for a moment, she's like, I'm sick and, like, she expresses how she actually feels for a moment. She's like, I'm sick yeah. of always being poor. I want nice things. She's basically envious of some other girl who can always buy whatever she I wants. I mean, I feel that on a daily basis also, you Same. know? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I would like to go get certain things done right on a regular basis like get my hair done get my nails mm-hmm. done like buy clothes that fit a specific appeal like mm-hmm. <laughs> but yet i have to make budget things but i'm allowed to complain about it every so often yes, and just exactly. say what? this is just what it is <laughs> <laughs> so then of course her husband feels bad and he apologizes to her for not being able to provide her with the nice things that she deserves and then, of course, she feels guilty about it. She's like, oh, my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, we see Amy in Paris, and she has decided to quit painting. So she's wanted to be a painter all her life, and basically this is what she was pursuing. She wants to quit because she is a failure. She wants to be great, or she wants nothing at all. I think her paintings are great. So I'm trying to figure Perfectly. out, like, what is her bar of great? That's something that also doesn't get discussed in this. But I also wanted to point out that all of these girls have some kind of artistic endeavor. So yes. Joe writes, uh, Amy paints, Beth plays the piano, and then Meg acts. So mm-hmm. they're all very artistic and very creative people. And so it's mm-hmm. really neat to see them really embrace that and, and be able to celebrate that throughout this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they each have their own passions that they follow. <laughs> I think earlier, so earlier when she was in an actual painting class, and you could see her like comparing her work to other people's. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if maybe at that point she was like, like she didn't feel good enough. Yeah, I think you she know, was she's expressing because it. the the other student that was in her class was doing more of an expressionist painting and she was doing more of a realistic painting. Mm-hmm. And so I think this might have been during like the impressionist movement or something of that nature, especially in France where you've got like Monet mm-hmm. and all that stuff, because that's the type of like brush strokes that you see there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it had to do with, she didn't feel like her work was great because it didn't match with the, the latest artistic trends, you know, mm-hmm. like that artistic trend really defined that era, especially in mm-hmm. Europe. And so, yeah, yeah, I can understand that to an extent. Probably that it wasn't just like innovative enough. Like it wasn't, right. there was nothing special about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So Lori then asks her what she plans on doing now that she's given up on her artistic hopes. And she says, polish up on her other talents and become an ornament to society. (laughs) (laughs) Ain't that the truth? She tells him that if Fred Vaughn asks for her hand, that she will most likely say yes, because he is very rich, even richer than him. I mean, women had only so many options during this time. So you have to figure (laughs) out, right? I know, right? (laughs) So that's when she does like her speech about women and how marriage is an economic proposition. And so fun fact, that speech was actually not in the initial script and it was suggested by Meryl Streep. So she wanted 
there, she thought that there needed to be a moment in the movie that allowed modern audiences to understand the true power, true powerlessness of women in that period. I like that addition because it is something that too. when you take something from a period of time and you don't give it context and how it's different from the modern age, it makes it difficult okay. to relate to and understand as to like, why wouldn't you just leave him when they're talking about an era when divorce is an impossibility for women? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's just an example. Mm -hmm. And that it was perfect. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then we flash back to a day at the beach uh, with all the girls, Lori, and he invited a few of his friends. So that's when Amy meets Fred Vaughn for the first time. And she is bold. She introduces herself immediately. And she tells him to remember that name because she's going to come find him in London one day. <laughs> I love it. I do too. I love the confidence. <laughs> so in the scene, everyone is just having a jolly time. Meg and John also begin to get like a little friendly together. They're very and cute. We're adorable. Yeah. <laughs> so in a previous scene... Meg loses one of her gloves and John finds it. Yes. I guess he just kept it. <laughs> it's like Cinderella. She lost a glove. <laughs> Cinderella lost the shoe. But there was like no it that we return it her again. Yeah, the whole thing. Lori, to you yeah. <laughs> Lori uh, tells Joe, he's like, I know something. And she's like, what? And she's like, John has Meg's uh, glove. glove or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She freaks about. She's like, "What? Oh my god! <laughs> How could he do this? Why would he keep a glove? What kind of serial killer is this guy?" <laughs> I mean, that's, that's oh man, but it was too cute, too funny. <laughs> but yeah, so everyone's just having a great time at the beach. So it's definitely like a happy memory for all of them. Mm -hmm. We also see Amy is doing some of her drawings, and that is when she draws a a picture of. So flashback to Beth and, oh, flash forward. I'm sorry. I'm getting my flashes mixed up. So we're flashing forward to modern day and Beth and Joe are at the beach together. So she's reading her stories. Again, the ones that are getting published, I think, the ones that she's selling. And she mm -hmm. tells her that she really likes her stories better. And she asks her to write her, she asks her to write her a story for her because she's very sick and she has to do it because she's dying. <laughs> Love the guilt trip. Right. <laughs> like, that makes it so easy. It's like when you're getting married and you're like, it's bad luck to say no to the bride on the wedding day. You have to help me out with this this task. I know. So it looks like Marmy is volunteering for the troops. It looks like maybe she's giving out some sort of, I don't know what exactly it is, like maybe blankets. I don't know if like food is involved. Something just yeah, to help them out. Anything they may need. Anything, literally. Yeah. Because at one point she takes off her own scarf and tucks it away and gives it to someone. But that's when she receives a telegram from the army and she has to leave at once. Because father has been wounded. Father and she is has wounded. to go to Washington, D. Yep. So she comes home to pack up immediately. She's telling the girls that it's going to be a rough winter, but they'll get through. And that's when Joe comes and she gives her $25 for the trip. And she's like, how did you get this money? Turns out she cut off all her hair. <laughs> I think she was supposed to go ask Aunt Marge, but she didn't feel like she was too intimidated to do that. So she's like, it's just easier oh, if yeah. I just cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, what's a couple of months of me growing it back? It's nothing yeah. compared to the like five minutes it's going to take to ask Aunt Marge oh, if God. I can yeah. have $25. <laughs> the torture of having to ask that woman. Yeah. <laughs> But it's so funny because everybody is like shocked and they're like, oh my God. And Amy's like, you're one true beauty. <laughs> I know, it's so good. Oh, um, but her mom is so proud of her. Like she's yeah, just of course. so proud of her for being willing to sacrifice and also just being able to help and mm -hmm. standing up for it. The thing I love about Marnie or Marmy, Marmy, I kept calling her Marnie. The thing I love about Marmy yeah. is I feel like the girls could do anything and she would still be immensely proud of them. She just seems She's like She's so mom. sweet. Mm -hmm. She's the best mom ever. She sounds like the most nurturing heart. And then and later... What was that? 
I said, she's so giving. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So later on that night, Joe is crying on the stairs. And Amy comes over. She's like, is it father? And she's like, it's my hair. <laughs> and Amy's like, it oh, is a dastardly haircut. It, I tell it, you it that. It was a drastic cut. Like, <laughs> not drastic, dastardly. Like, just bad. Oh, that too. But yeah. <laughs> Horrible. It's like the worst page boy haircut I've ever seen. Like, my God. <laughs> you get what you pay for. Or she probably didn't even pay for it. She just... I was like, she got paid for it. Like, she <laughs> did not pay for it. Well, so that's going to make it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, hack, 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 <laughs> hack, 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 that into a bag. Yentl, look, that is what, what the movie we did. Yentl. That is what Yentl's yeah. hair should have looked like. That's what it should have looked like when she's doing it herself with the mirror and it only yeah. a candle to light her way. <laughs> that is a perfect example of what it should have looked like. So she's on the stairs crying about her hair and Amy's like, I would cry too. And she's like, I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a small dig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. So we flash forward to present day to Amy and Lori together in a garden in Paris and she's drawing a photo of him. And Lori ends up telling her to not marry Vaughn. Fred. Something, Fred, Fred Vaughn. She's just like, stop it. You're being mean. That's so rude. I've loved you my entire life. And that she will not be the person that he settles for because he cannot have Joe. I love her performance in this scene. Like, it is so good. It's so powerful mm -hmm. and emotional and you can really feel it. And mm -hmm. like... I do feel for her. Like it is, it's not mm -hmm. cool for you to just go from sister to oh, sister, right? man. <laughs> right. And especially after you've like pined for her sister and told her that you would never love anybody else ever again. And you die like, mm -hmm. dude. Yeah. <laughs> not cool. So we flash back to the girls. This is after Marmy has left. They're struggling to make ends meet. They're trying to keep up with all their tasks. Amy is, for whatever reason, creating like a cast of her foot for know, Lori. To give to Lori. I don't know why. I was so confused by that. I, anyways, there's a lot going on. There's the, <laughs> Joe's writing her stuff. Poor Meg is trying to keep the family together and actually trying to keep everyone afloat. And then Beth, I guess Marmy had asked them to keep up with checking in on that woman and her children. And Beth is like, we need to like go check in on them. They need food. And they're like, we can barely feed ourselves. So they're just like kind of like done with them. Mm -hmm. So she decides to go help them by herself. So when Beth returns from helping out that family, she comes home to a new piano from Mr. Lawrence. So also I'm confused by my notes. She goes over to his money. house after that. Yeah. Right. I don't know why I put so much money. Um, <laughs> Cause a piano. I know. What am I saying? <laughs> so after that, yeah, she goes over to tell him thank you. And that's when he tells her that she reminds him so much of his little girl. <laughs> but he also discovers that Beth is ill. He's like, you are hot. So they discover she has scarlet fever. Everyone has had it except for Amy. Uh, so they send her away to go stay with Aunt March. And then we flash forward to present time to Joe reading one of her stories to Beth again at the beach. Beth loves it and she asks her to keep writing her stories even after she's gone. Because <laughs> she knows like her time is coming. Right. And then we get another flashback to Joe just caring for Beth. It's a lot of these flashing back and forth, basically, essentially, and just caring for Beth. It's like a Rolodex of flashbacks. Like, oh, yeah. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> so Amy, younger Amy, is staying at Aunt Marge's place. And she tells her that she is now the family's final hope. Joe is a lost cause. Beth is sick. Meg is going to marry a poor man. <laughs> so she must marry well. <laughs> that stupid Meg marrying for love. How dare she? I know. How so, dare she marry a penniless tutor? I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> to me. So she must marry well in order to take care of not only her sisters, but her parents when they get old. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So then we flash forward to Amy in Paris. Uh, she comes back from being with Fred Vaughn. And Aunt March tells her that the Lori boy came by to tell her that he was leaving. And she's like, oh, shit. And <laughs> Aunt March is like, what is it? And she's like, I turned down Fred Vaughn's proposal. <laughs> and she is not happy about this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, boy. So, yeah. So, again, it's just a bunch of flashing forward and back of them caring for Beth while she's Get ill. Whiplash going from <laughs> five years ago to now. <laughs> yeah. And so younger Joe taking care of Beth. She wakes up next to Beth's bed and the bed is empty. She freaks out. She goes downstairs like she's like about to, like you could tell she's tearing up. But then she sees that Beth is well and better at the kitchen table. So then she made a recovery and they're all spending Christmas together and everybody is joyous and happy and well, and they're surprised with their father returning home, who is that actor that plays in Joe, not Colleen Saul, better call Saul. Uh, <laughs> no, I know him from now. <laughs> so then after that, like joyous, happy scene. We get a flash forward to present day, again, to Joe waking up next to Beth's bed. She goes downstairs and finds her mom at the table crying, and Beth has finally passed. So that's when, one of the things I never understood when I was watching this. I was like, okay, she got better, though. Like, what did she die mm -hmm. from? And so the 1994 version is very chronological. It all goes in, in the timeline that you're not flashing <laughs> forward and backwards from and yeah. so in the 1994 version they say like after she recovers from scarlet fever her heart is forever damaged essentially and so she dies from something but it's yeah. it's because she has like damage from scarlet fever mm -hmm. and so i don't know what kills her we don't find out I think they was, don't ever say they they mentioned it that she was they thought she was well again, but she ended up contracting it again or something like that. Something. Yeah. Yeah. So they briefly mentioned it, but I guess but they thought. so fast that literally she if you look away. But she didn't. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? And then, so after the burial, we flash back to Meg's and John's wedding day. Joe tells her, like, let's run away together. <laughs> You're going to be bored of him. You can be an actress. I'll be a writer. I'll take care of us. We're going to stay exciting forever. And she tells her, just because my dreams are different from yours, that doesn't mean that they're unimportant. Which is completely so like, fair. And I love that, you know, like... Mm -hmm. I have this conversation sometimes with people and it's like when I think of feminism, it's just being able to allow people to live the lives that they want to and not impeding mm -hmm. on that. And I think that this is a really great like snippet of that. It's mm -hmm. saying like we both have our own dreams and just because they're different, their mine's not unimportant or yours isn't unimportant. They're just different. And we all like we all have these things that we want to achieve in our life and that's OK. So mm -hmm. I really like to that part. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, and just how drastically different all of their lives are. It's mm -hmm. perfect. So at the wedding, Aunt March tells Amy that she wants to take her to Europe instead of Joe. So Amy comes running. She's like, Aunt March wants, Aunt, Mar Aunt March is going to Europe or something like that. And mm -hmm. Joe is like, oh, my God, and she's taking me. And she's already celebrating. And she's like, right. Oh. <laughs> She's it's like, me. um, I've been her companion since Beth got scarlet fever. So it's me. <laughs> oh, man. So later on, Laurie professes his love for Joe. That's when he does that big speech. I will always love you, Joe. And she's like, no. <laughs> she's like, no. Before he can even get a word out, she looks at it. She's like, no. She's like, don't do this. No, no, Laurie, Just... don't do this. Yeah. She tells him that they will be no good for each other. And of course, she also he's says, like, she is may never marry. And he's like, no, but you will. You'll find somebody that you're absolutely crazy for and you'll love and you'll die for. So sad that it won't be me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Flash forward to present day to Joe cleaning out 
uh, it looks like she's cleaning out the attic or I don't know if she's cleaning out, like putting away Beth's things. Mm -hmm. Um, And Marnie tells her that she's far too lonely here and that she should go back to New York to her friends. And Joe begins questioning whether or not she made a mistake turning down Lori, um, her mom. And she's like, do you think he'll ask? I think if he asks me again, I think I'm going to say yes. Her mom asks if she loves him. And she says that she doesn't care about that. She cares more about being loved. I get that. Yeah. It's nice mm-hmm. to be loved. Yeah. So we're back in Paris. Sorry. All of like the different settings. <laughs> it's, yeah. So we're back it's in a Paris. Lot. Back so forth, Amy just forth. found out that Beth had passed. Of course, she wasn't there, which is just awful. So she finally finds out. So she's heading back. And we thought that Lori had already left, but he didn't. So he comes back to accompany Amy on her way home. She tells him that she did not mar- that she's not married to Fred Vaughn and that he doesn't owe her anything. She doesn't expect anything, but that she just wanted to let him know. And of course, he kisses her. <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> <laughs> that's Me a wrap. Well, that's a wrap. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Joe decides to write Lori a letter saying that she made a mistake in turning him down. <laughs> oh, Ugh, man. So she, <laughs> she's with timing. <laughs> oh, God. I know. Right. So she's at home. She's asleep. Lori finds her alone. And he just tells her that he and Amy are married. Mm-hmm. Tells her she's that like, he's we wanted to lo- just be engaged, but we just... We ended yeah. up just getting married. It, it, it's, just, it's very Gilmore Girls when, oh when Lorelai and Chris are in Paris and they just get married. <laughs> I know. But like to do that on the way home after finding out that her sister passed, I feel like that I was know. That was like in bad taste, I feel like. <laughs> I feel like everybody could have used a wedding for cheering up maybe. I don't know. Or at least a week. <laughs> yeah, give it a little time. <laughs> <laughs> Let some grieving happen first, you know? Yes. (laughs) So, yeah. So he tells her that he's always loved her. He's always going to love her. But that the love that he feels for Amy is different. He says that she was right about them. And he asks them (laughs) and asks if they can still be friends. (laughs) Oh, goodness. So Joe, her, and Amy, they reunite. She congratulates them. Amy was like, I was so scared to tell you, but... She ends up congratulating them anyways. So Joe has to go and retrieve that letter (laughs) she wrote. (laughs) She goes, she ends up throwing it into like a body of water of some sort. I don't know if that's like a stream or a river. And she runs into... Yeah. (laughs) So she runs into Mr. Lawrence and he tells her that he couldn't bring himself to come over knowing that she wouldn't be there. She being Beth, of course. I know. Oh, gosh. I know. So sad for him, too. It was almost yeah. losing, like, two girls. Yeah, it was, oh. like, losing his water all over again. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, doo, doo, doo. I'm guessing that night, uh, Joe wakes up uh, one night, or some night. She pulls out a book that says, uh, For Beth, on the inside. And she just decides to begin writing like a maniac. And she is writing all night, all day. I don't know how many days pass. But until the entire floor is covered in pages. It could have been years. We don't know. <laughs> and I've never seen somebody like lay out page and page and page on the floor. Like, why would you That's do that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, just maybe just for dramatic effect. Mind. I don't know. <laughs> Especially since you can't just like reprint a new one like you can today. Like, oh, yeah. that's risky oh, like, business. I didn't like, it happened. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, yeah. So she writes to the publisher to send her the first few pages. At this point, apparently Aunt March died at some point. <laughs> it's a, yeah. It was the, mentioned the at all. <laughs> so it was earlier mentioned that she was sick. But oh. we didn't realize how serious it was. It's like, not oh, like she's Beth. not feeling well. Beth was too sick yeah. to... For us to care yeah. about Aunt March. <laughs> she overshadowed Aunt March's illness. Um, but apparently Aunt March ended up leaving her her house. She's like, I mm-hmm. thought she hated me. 
And I think it's Meg who's like, yeah, she can hate you, but still leave you her house. She's like, I want to do something. She's like, I want to sell it. And I want to do something that'll make Aunt March turn in her grave. And they're like, that's me. Not There's a whole lot. Like just a little bit. Not a lot. Just a, <laughs> yeah. Just a chill. Just. <laughs> oh, God. So she's decided she's going to open up. At first she said a woman's school. But then I thought mm-hmm. she mentioned for boys and girls, too. So she's opening up a school. Right. So she mentioned that she wanted to open up a school for girls and then mm-hmm. for, for her niece to go to. And then Meg was like, but what about Demi, her her son, which is Joe's nephew? And she's like, mm-hmm. you know what? You're right. A school for boys and girls. There we go. Yep. <laughs> so she tells the girls that she's writing a story about their little life. <clears throat> and she receives a letter back from the publisher. And he says, although they don't seem very promising, that he wants her to continue sending him her pages. This is an odd publisher. Like, (laughs) (laughs) he's very much like, this isn't terribly good, but I'll take it. Thank you. (laughs) And she's like, I'll take it too. Okay, you got it. (laughs) So Joe ends up receiving a surprise visit from Frederick. And then we flash back to the moment that uh, Joe and Frederick first met. And then we flash forward again. <laughs> this is so quick, too. It's like 30 seconds. And I'm oh like, was this really necessary? Like, we already fast. know that they, like, teach the same place. Like, we yeah. was understood. <laughs> <laughs> We've already seen them lust after each other in their eyes. Like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, gosh. And I love how, like, the whole time, like, everybody's grading Frederick. They're like, oh, my gosh, hi, welcome, welcome. And the whole time, Lori's just oh, like, who is Anna, this guy? The, what, the, like, maid <laughs> is like, he's so handsome, Joe, right in front of him. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> oh, goodness, so funny. Frederick joins them for a meal. And he mentions that he plans on going west, given that there's nothing there that's keeping him. And hint, hint, nudge, hint, nudge. Hint, right now. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Give me a reason to stay. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So he sees Beth's piano and asks if anybody plays. And they mention that Beth, who passed, plays. And he says, I'm so sorry. But they asked him to play the piano, that she wouldn't want it to be quiet. <laughs> Or for no one to play with it. And of course, he plays beautifully. And then I, we're still in present time, I'm thinking. So, <laughs> I think so. Joe meets with the publisher and tells him that he has an issue because he's like, what happens to her? What is her ending? She's like, oh, the character does not get married. Like, that's not what she wants. It's never what she wanted. And oh my gosh, I think this is where I ran out. <laughs> So, so uh, yeah. back at, at the home, like Frederick leaves and her oh, sisters okay. are like, um, excuse me, you love him. How can you not see it? You need mm-hmm. to go and get him before he leaves for California. So they I like I missed take a chunk from the publisher. The <laughs> yeah. So we flash back to that scene. <laughs> so, yeah. So Frederick leaves. They're like, oh, my God, you need to go after him. But yeah, so she goes to profess her love for Frederick. And he tells her that he will not leave if she wants him to stay. So It's so well funny, done. too, the way he does it. He's like, I won't leave if you want me to stay. And she's like, I want you to stay. And he's like, but I have nothing. And she's like, I don't care. <laughs> like, what a thing to do. Right, right. Um, and I then think... they kiss. And yeah. she writes it into her book. And mm-hmm. she gives it to the publisher. And he's like, great. We'll call this chapter Under the Umbrella. <laughs> okay. Oh, goodness. Right. And then she ends up opening up her school for boys and girls now. But she she negotiates with the publisher, well, which yeah. I think is important, too, because mm-hmm. he tells her, you know what, you can either get 5% of the royalties or mm-hmm. if you let me buy the copyright, I'll give you $500. And so she negotiates and gets him to bump it up to 6.6%. And then... She's going to keep her copyright. And then we get this like long drawn out uh, process of what it took to make a book at that point in time. And I'm like, oh, my good Lord. It's amazing that we have books. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. The printing process and all of that. Oh, gosh. 
like it's beautiful but it's also it's like damn <laughs> <laughs> and then i think that's the end i think that's the end <laughs> oh my gosh Thank goodness. <laughs> so does it pass the back test yes this it would have to pass <laughs> so random trivia this movie was actually filmed entirely in massachusetts and then it was released December 25th of 2019, so 25 years after Little Woman 1994's version. So Florence Pugh had just finished filming Midsommar, uh, 2019's Midsommar. Did you see that? No, I haven't, but I've listened to like different recaps of it a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Anyways, so she had just finished filming that a few days prior to when she started shooting for this movie, which is like, oh my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> wild. I know. <laughs> so she said that getting to play Amy after making such a stressful and, and anxiety inducing movie was her version of therapy. I think we still <laughs> need to get therapy, but I know. I was about to say, girl, outlet. you need real therapy after that one. The last, like, Greta Gerwig was six months pregnant with her first child when filming ended and went into 48 hours after turning in her rough edit. So she hid her pregnancy during filming so well that nobody on set knew she was pregnant. The things you have to do as a woman sometimes. Right. Right. <laughs> like, I'm not pregnant, I swear. <laughs> Just excuse me while I go to the bathroom uh, a lot. 50 times. <laughs> yeah, 50 times. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh goodness. Okay. So that is it. So Kenzie, on the caffeine scale, what does this rank for you? <laughs> I see this is a solid three with an asterisk that it's only a solid three if you pay attention and you don't leave your seat and you don't use the bathroom. You can't and <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't blink, honestly. Like this movie. <laughs> I, I like this movie a lot and I like mm -hmm. how it's told, but it's, it's, it's so hard to tell like when you're in the past and when you're in the future and like some things mm -hmm. are questioned, like I have no idea what happened in certain parts, even mm -hmm. to this day, even though I've watched it twice now and I'm like, oh, good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I think it's a good movie. It's fairly entertaining, but yeah, it's, it just hits like middle, of, middle of the mark for me. I'm just like yeah. down the, middle of the road. <laughs> How about you? Oh, goodness. This one's solid four for me. So before writing notes for this, <laughs> I was like, oh, this is such a great movie. I, I really love this movie. I think it's entertaining. I think it was beautifully shot. And oh, yeah. I, I actually liked the back and forth to an extent. Towards the end, it gets a little much, though. Or a lot of much. Um, but <laughs> I had one time period for five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. So other than that, yeah, I, I, I really did enjoy this movie. I think, I, I think I like that there's different versions for different generations. And I'll still have to go back to watch the other ones for sure. So I think that'll be yeah. interesting to compare and contrast them. But I think overall it was a really good movie. Mm -hmm. I Highly recommend. Same thing. At least one. Yes. Well, Just pay attention. <laughs> like you said, don't leave. Don't. Uh, don't, like, don't uh, like, I don't know how people did it at the movie theaters. Like, I'm one of those people who has to use the bathroom all the time. And I'm just like, I have to make sure that it's at a decent time or a, a movie that I know that if I leave for five minutes, I'm not going to miss anything too pivotal but this was impossible i was like oh yeah. good lord <laughs> <laughs> oh no so we should probably announce that we are taking a break again um yes so we are taking a bit of a break from putting out new episodes and we will return again with a new episode on march 5th but between now and then we're gonna be working on some fun episodes and updates for y'all so we hope that you look forward to that and in the meantime i will be reposting some of the previous episodes that we've done with some of our phenomenal guests in the case that you missed those and we may have some 
special episodes from some crossover episodes that we have been a part of in between. So we hope you look forward to that. Thank you for listening to another episode of Caffeinated Flicks. We're a self-published podcast produced and edited by Kempi. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what films you'd like us to cover, what we can do better, or just say hi. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can follow us on Instagram at caffeinatedflixpod or email us at caffeinatedflix at gmail.com. We'll catch you on the flick side. <laughs>